Hey guys, welcome back to the Compass Games Learn to Play series. Today we welcome designer Joe Fernandez, who is going to teach us how to fly and fight in the skies of his new solitaire tactical air game, Storm of Steel. It's time for takeoff, so over to you, Joe. Hello everyone, this is Joe Fernandez. I'm the designer of Storm of Steel Stuka Eastern Front, and I'm going to teach you how to play a mission, uh, utilizing the how to play Play 8 and some references from the rulebook. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to roll to select the mission type and then the zones. The way we do that is we roll one D10 from the A1 table, which is going to give us the type of target, and a D6, which is going to give you the zone or the distance from the airfield. We're playing Operation Barbarossa 1941, the August to October 41 segment which has a specific types of targets, specific escort and fighter interested tables. So every table has a timeline. We're going to be playing August through October 41. We're going to roll a D10 off camera. Uh, it's a result of 10 and a D6, 3. So what that means is that we're going to be attacking an airfield on zone 3. So that's approximately 150 kilometers per zone from the airfield. So we're going to select the airfield mission chit and put it there. As you can see here, the airfield is a large target that's also going to play into the accuracy on and the attack for the staffel. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to select the aircraft that we're going to be using. Since this is already into Operation Barbarossa, we have six operational Stukas with our crew. Some Stukas are getting repaired or being replaced. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, so we place the six Stuka cards on the mat, starting with the flight leader on the one position, two, three, four, five, and six. We are also going to place the seven through ten number chits and place the one through six for random uh, chit pulls uh, throughout the game so we're going to have that ready and we're going to start off with the mission itself so we move over to this mission zone track and the staff will move to zone number one now the first thing you do when you conducting the mission is you're going to pull an event card so the first event spots in distance. So the woman calls over the radio fighters at 12 o'clock. They're just bird, so nothing happens with this uh, event. So the staff will uh, move on to zone number two. Now, zone number one, we do not conduct a check for fighter intercept for 1941. If you go to chart number Right, table B2. So we are on the August, October table for the Luftwaffe escort. And from the airfield and sun number one, we still have full cover. So we don't have to worry about Soviet intercepts for that time period. Things get worse for the Germans as, as the uh, operation progresses. So we'll look into that later. But we pull another event card and we reach the waypoint. So another no effect card. Uh, we've reached the waypoint without an incident. You're going to get a mix of uh, positive, negative, and some neutral events uh, as you fly your planes through the, through the mission. So So we're going to reach the mission area for the airfield. On the mission zone area, we do not roll for intercept and we do not pull an event card. So this is where the mission takes place. The first thing that we're going to do is roll 1d6 on the A4 table. The A4 table is the weather table. Let me show you this is the table. It's actually, it's abstract that is a visibility table a4 so this may be battlefield is this is filled with smoke 
It could be a weather event. So you roll 1d6, rolled a 2. Uh, you look here on the table, and it's good weather. Go over to the mat and place the disability on good. Uh, what that does is it gives you a zero DRM for good, and then you start getting into the positive DRMs for roles and medium visibility and low visibility. So this one is good visibility. The next thing we're going to do over the target area is roll for anti-aircraft fire. The most important tables of the game are in the map board. So we have the A6 anti-aircraft table right here, and we're going to roll 1d10. So it's a 3. The 3 is light anti-aircraft fire. That means that one aircraft is hit by the Soviet anti-aircraft fire. So we pull a random aircraft from the chit hat here as aircraft number three. So we go to the aircraft number three, and that's gonna be the target aircraft for the anti-aircraft hat. And from there, we're going to move over to the C1 aircraft damage table, which is this table here. It's also on your handouts and player aids. So we check that table, and we, we already selected the random aircraft hit, which is number three. And we're going to roll 1d10 for the system of the aircraft that's going to be hit, and 1d6 for the severity of the hit. We're going to roll a flying, D10 is a 5, and the D6 is a 4. So we cross-reference a 5 is general damage. It's something that's not system-specific, but it affected the aircraft and the crew. And they add 3 crew stress, which is a, also a dynamic that mimics uh, fatigue and other factors for the crew. So we're going to put three stress markers on number three aircraft and that's all for the anti-aircraft attack on the staffel now beginning from left to right we're going to start our bombing run so for that we're going to be consulting the bombing accuracy which is table a2 and that's on the player eight and handouts but you have that here as well for easy reference so you can mark your scores as you go forward on the game as you go forward with the attack so the flight leader goes first he's an ace so aces get a minus drm on the attack so they get a better odds of hitting the target now since it's a large area that we're attacking large target you're going to roll a d10 minus one for the flight leader drm and he rolls a three minus one is a two so he scores 80 on the attack so we're going to mark him score 80. Uh, we're going to go off to the next aircraft is a veteran pilot veterans don't get any drms they get drms on landings and bailouts but not on attack runs so he's going to roll a d10 rolls a six bombing attack accuracy roll and that's a 40. so we place the score on him Jericho's trumpets are blaring and the third crew is going to attack now now they have a plus three stress that means anything after two they're going to get a positive drm so we're going to increase the drm by one Okay, and we're going to roll on the D10 table two, and he scores another six. Look at the bombing attack accuracy. So another six is it's plus one it is seven, so it's a 30. But he scores a six, I'm sorry. So he's he's back to 40. We already have we already did the DRM on the roll. So he scores a 40 as number two, even though he had a uh, a positive DRM. So we go on to aircraft number four. He's also a veteran, so he doesn't get any any attack DRMs for this uh, bomb run. 
and he rolls a four. So a four is on a large target, it's 60. Okay. Now we're going to uh, aircraft number five, another veteran. He also has a crew stress uh, from previous missions, so I couldn't get a pilot that was, you know, no no stress. That's that's the part you have to manage about your staff. You're gonna have pilots available with different levels of stress on them, and sometimes you just gotta fly them how they are. So this this crew here has a a plus came into the mission with uh, two stress each, so they do also get a DRM of, of one. And we're gonna roll. Roll a two. But since I got the RMs, it's a three, so they score a 70. So they, they did better than some of the other crews that don't have stress, so they scored eight and seven. And the last crew, which is aircraft number three, is a green crew. They don't get any DRM either, but they attack normally. And they roll a D10, they score a three. So a three is a 70 on a large target. It goes here. And scores a 70. Now the attack sequence is over. We've sustained a one anti-aircraft uh, hit. Now the staff is going to head back to base. The same thing is done in reverse. So you have your staff at zone number three. Now they're going back to zone number two. Now on the way back, we're going to roll for first of all an event. Uh, we're going to reveal the event. Heard the one about the, so it's a joke and you can remove one stress from one crew. So I'm gonna look at my aircraft and see uh, which one I wanna remove. They have three stress, so I'm gonna remove this two here. Okay, and then I am going to roll for intercept on zone number two. So the first thing I do is go to the B1 table, and we're on the August, October segment of Barbarossa. I'm going to roll a D10, and we roll a 6. So that's two MiG-3s that are going to be attacking the Staffel. There's going to be two aircraft here. Now we're going to see for uh, Luftwaffe Escort. So now we go to another chart, which is the Luftwaffe escort table. And we're going to roll uh, 1d6 for, again, the August, October 41 on zone 2, which is right here. Roll a 5. What that means is that we, the escort is successful in removing one of the two aircraft that are attacking the Staffel. Had I roll a 1 or 4, it would have removed both fighters, so I would it would have been a null attack. So one got through and is going to attack the Staffel. Now, move one here. The escort was successfully removing one, so we're going to pull from the uh, cup, and the flight leader gets it. So we go to the flight leader and put the target on him. So the flight leader is going to get hit, and that's your ace. Um, that's one guy you really don't want if you're playing a campaign or, or at least one of the larger operations like Barbarossa. Those are the guys you don't want to lose. So now we're going to table B3, which is the enemy fighter approach and attack table. You're going to roll two dice, one white and one colored D6. Now the white die, it provides you for the approach for the attacking aircraft. And the colored die provides how many planes the attack and aircraft is going to hit. So even though I selected one, if I roll a six, I'm going to have to go back into the chit and pull another aircraft to get hit. So I'm going to roll now. So a four and a three. So the approach is from the rear. So we're going to put the attacking aircraft here. And um, the color is a three, which is one plane, two CS. So the number one aircraft's gonna get the, the two CS, crew stress. So we're gonna go and clone this one.
the gunner and the pilot both get the hit from the aircraft. All right, that's the basic protocol for enemy attacks and intercepts and, and Luftwaffe escort. So now we're going to move the Staffel to mission zone number one. We already know from the escort table that we have full cover in zone one, so I want to roll for fighter intercept here. However, you do have to do an event card in front of foe. So this one I have to assign one CS to the leader, so the, the leader gets another crew stress attached to it. So now they have three crew stress, and now the Staffel is going back to the airfield. So the staff is going back to the to land on the aerodrome. And the landing procedure is covered by the play rate, table C5. That up here. Um, okay, so C5 landing table. So as a D10 roll at one through nine, you have a safe landing, a 10 is a forced landing. However, there are some DRMs to take into consideration. You if you have a damaged landing gear, plus two, if you have four or more CSs, if the pilot is one that you get one DRM or a damaged engine tail or three CS. So I have the leader who has three crew stress, so he's going to get a plus one DRM. And I think that's just the flight leader. They're, this have two, so they're good. They won't get a DRM for a landing. So, all right, we're going to start from left to right, leader first, and we're going to start rolling. We're going to do this. Let me see if I can pull this here so I can see it. We're going to do the leader first. Ah, he's a five, six. He's good. Number two aircraft is a six. He's good. Number three aircraft is a nine. Let me just make sure that the crew stress is not a 10. That's good. Number four aircraft is a one. Excellent. Number five is a 10. All right. So number five has a force landing. So from there, we're going to move on to the force landing survival table, which is 1D10. Right. So we're going to roll another D10. And that's a five. So on a one through seven, damage. So the aircraft is going to be damaged and aircraft repair timer of three. The crew is going to be okay. So number five aircraft is going to go into the uh, damage pool. He's going to get a damage timer on the number three spot. And the crew is fine. They're going to be put into the whole crew holding area. All right, and we have one more aircraft that's got to land and that's uh, aircraft number six. He's the one, he's good to go. So basically the staff landed, one of the aircraft had a, a force landing and they had to damage uh, the Stuka, so now uh, the mission is finished and we score it. The way we score it is we add all the scores and divide the final amount by the aircraft that were flown. So 80, 80 plus 40. Plus 40. Plus. 60 plus 70 plus another 70. And so 360, and you divide those by the number of aircraft that took part of the raid, so in the mission. So it's going to be a total score of 60. And that makes the mission victorious is 55 through 75 on the A5 score. Now you're going to keep carrying the scores over, log them on your, on your logbook as missions progress and, and however many uh, operations you want to participate in or the entire campaign. So once you score it, you're going to log it in your logbook and then 
we're coming over here to do the end of turn reminder. So the game is, is divided into the mission, which we just played, and then you have to manage your crew. Okay, so we just placed uh, these the pilot and gunner who survived the force landing into the available holding area. And this is the way that the hospital and the damaged aircraft work. Every time a mission is completed and the crew didn't participate in the mission, they, they go down the wounded pilot track one. So Lang and Ledman came down one. So they were position number three, number two. So now they're number one and number two. A wounded gunner, he was on four, now he's going to be three. Once they reach available in the next mission, they get moved over to the available crew holding area. But for now, they're in the hospital. From the crew holding area, they don't we don't take any stress counters of them because they just arrived at the airfield. So from here, we remove one stress each for every mission that's completed that they don't participate in. So they have two stress. I'm going to put one. So instead of four, now they have three. Instead of two, now it has one. And he's available for flight. Any of them are available. So the only ones that are not available are the ones who are in the hospital. You can fly your crews. You can assign crews to your missions from the crew holding area, regardless of the crew stress. However, once they reach six crew stress points, they have to bail out. So you have to be cognizant of that. And also all the DRMs that are affected if you send out crews that are completely stressed out, high fatigue. So the damaged aircraft repair and replace table, you move that one one as well every time. Here, these two go here. And now you have a damaged aircraft available. So you take one from here and place it again on your flight line. And that's your end of turn reminders, you know, for all your uh, crew and aircraft. Something about ordnance. I didn't use any specialty ordnance for this mission. However, you can use uh, several. I used a standard payload of one 500 pounder and, and the 50 wing mounted SCs. Uh, but you can also use uh, two 1,000 pounders per mission to give you more DRMs or one. 1800 pounder but to carry that you, you can't have a gunner and their zones are limited so it limits what type of missions you can fly with those types of bombs so you also can get maritime attack missions which would require specialty ordnance in order to get a better hit on, on for example cruisers and battleships uh, to mimic what brutal and some of the stukas would attack the baltic fleet that also uh, you have a whole range of missions that you can play and you can keep track of all your pilots on the provided mission log sheet from compass which is very comprehensive and you can play one mission put the game away and then play some other day and you have dozens of pilot personages that you can play with you can name your own there is also a jua7g variant for the kursk part of the uh, game you're going to be playing there with cutters or two to three aircraft formations to attack mostly enemy armor. You can see here on Operation Citadel in 1943. Those are fun. The game includes a, a one page how to play, which uh, should get everyone up and going with everything I showed in this video. You can be up and running in very, very short time without with minimal reference to the rule book. Once you get the game, Pretty much down, this is all the charts you're probably going to need for most of the gameplay. So you won't even have to look at the rule book or the charts. Once you get going with the game, you can just reference the most important charts that are included in the map board. And that's a wrap. I hope uh, everybody enjoys the game. I hope uh, it is uh, something different. Uh, bring some nuance to the genre that instead of flying one aircraft or some abstractions, you can actually command a squad of aircraft with individual crew with individual names giving you a deeper narrative experience uh, you can fly your planes from 
June of 1941 um, all the way to 1943, which was the effective operational range of the Stuka and the Eastern Front. So I hope everyone enjoys the video. Uh, there's a little, there's a lot more to the game, but this is the basics of the game as 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 I envision it. And I see you out on on the forums. Looking forward to uh, your feedback and you enjoying the game. Thank you very much for joining us and have a great day.